very glad to have met you. Very glad indeed. Благодарим вас за помощь, которую оказали вы нам в войне против гитлеровской Германии. Thank you very much. We don't understand the language, but we mean the same thing. President Harry Truman came to Europe with a bad idea in his suitcase. He thought Joseph Stalin was jolly old Uncle Joe, to be trusted as one of the policemen of the new peace. At the little White House in Potsdam, Generalissimo Stalin of Russia is one of the first to welcome the president, as the meeting is recorded by Signal Corps and newsreel cameras. Next to join the group is Prime Minister Churchill, who meets an old conference friend. It had already been agreed that the Red Army should free Eastern Europe from the Nazis. At Potsdam, they agreed the Red Army should stay there. We hoped against our better judgment that because he'd signed up to the United Nations, Stalin shared our values and ideals. Thus, half knowing what we did, we handed Eastern Europe over to communism. Here at Potsdam, the Allies partitioned Europe. Was it inevitable? There are critics, now and indeed then, who say that it could have been avoided. And certainly it's true that the new president, Truman, and the new Labour government in Britain still had naive ideas about Stalin and about the Soviet Union. But I wonder if they could have done anything much different. The Red Army was where the Red Army was, in possession of almost all the lands involved. Would it have been possible to get the West back into action, this time against their Soviet ally? Would it, for example, have been at all easy to persuade the British people to forget so soon those Arctic convoys to Murmansk, or indeed the sword for heroism, which the king had given to the defenders of Stalingrad. When Johnny comes marching home upon this shore again, we'll pray that you never have to go to war again. Now we all know what Johnny did at war, but do you know what he did before? Won't you listen? Everybody wanted the troops to come home. We were to get disarmed. We were the, the war was over, and the UN was going to take care of things, and there would be no more war. We didn't believe that exactly, but we did think it was going to be a good period of peace. And then things began to change. Then the reality of communism broke through. The countries of Eastern Europe saw their small flickers of freedom snuffed out. Yugoslavia, but also Poland. The Polish election was a test. The Soviets pledged a free democratic election in Poland. There was wrangling and delay, and when the election was finally held, it was a totalitarian affair staged by a red dictatorship. At last, America saw communism's true face. It was a ruthless force led by a dictator whose atrocities were as great as Hitler's, but the result of calculation rather than frenzy. It was also a missionary force which would exploit misery and resentment everywhere to spread its rule. So a new policy was born to stop it. They called it containment. The Americans soon discovered that Stalin's Russia was not a friendly neighborhood policeman sharing their values, but a dictatorship determined to fasten its brutal kind of dictatorship on its neighbors. So they turned to containment. Containment meant admitting for the moment that the Soviet Union had what it had. 
but doing your damnedest to make sure they didn't get any more. It meant, after all, keeping those American troops in Europe that they'd hoped to bring home. And it meant spending a pile of American taxpayers' money helping the Europeans to rebuild their broken industries. This was a thoroughly sensible mix of realism and idealism. Under Truman, it developed, it bore fruit, to the great benefit of us all. In 1947, starvation and unemployment caused riots in France and Italy. They too might have gone communist. So America pumped billions into Western Europe under the Marshall Plan, and it worked. She learned that self-interest and ideals could coincide. In the beginning, nobody anticipated how big it would be. I think if, you, if anyone had known what the total bill would have, it would have That's scared right. them to death. Yes. Uh, that would have been a part of the problem. Secondly, they were, there was beginning to be a realization that this was in our interest too. The Marshall Plan, for, for example, was in our interest too. It helped trade, it opened markets for us. It did all sorts of things that were very much to be desired. American aid? I can't say I've thought about it much, not really. I do hope it doesn't mean a war with Russia. Of course it doesn't. But it should do a lot to stop communism spreading in Europe. Damn good thing. Mummy, do you think that American aid is a good thing? I've no idea. You better ask your father. I've got far too much to do. At Grafenvor in Bavaria, the United States First Division puts into action MDAP, the Mutual Defense Assistance Program, by setting up an arms training school. There, officers and men of the Atlantic Pact nations are learning to handle American weapons, now being supplied to their countries in ever-increasing numbers. NATO was formed, a military dike to check the communist flood. NATO members were or became democracies with shared ideals. NATO's military strength held the line, and in the end, our ideals triumphed. A international system was created that protected the populations, uh, produced unprecedented prosperity, and at the end of 40 years, achieved everything it set out to do. In fact, that's one of our present problems. What do you do after you've achieved all your objectives? So I think the period after 1945 is a great tribute to Western statesmanship. But what worked in Europe did not work elsewhere. In Asia, containment began to crack. China fell into civil war, and containment was too passive to stop Mao establishing himself as the emperor of 600 million people. A year later, communist North Korea invaded the South and was repelled just. But communism was on the march again, and the fear of communism unbalanced America. They are lying, dirty, shrewd, godless, murderous, determined. It was a rough time, and a period I, I think is a, is a bad, bad, black, black botch band on our past. I think it's a ter it was a terrible period. It's an international criminal conspiracy. Americans saw conspiracy everywhere, in government, in Hollywood, the White House. Time, they thought, to replace containment with something more active, more idealistic, more American. We're living in a country that's the finest place on earth. But some folks don't appreciate this land that gave them birth. I hear that up in Washington they're having an awful buzz. Cause communists and spies are making monkeys out of us. The bureaus and departments have been busy night and day. They're figuring out just how we gave our secrets all away. And Congress has appointed a committee, so they said, to find out who's American and who's a low-down red. Eisenhower rode this mood to win the 1952 election. He denounced containment. He promised a new, more active policy. No more would America abandon people to communism. Conceiving the defense of freedom, like freedom itself to be one and indivisible, we hold all continents and peoples in equal regard and honor. We reject any insinuation that one race or another, one people or another, is in any sense inferior 
or expendable. If the fine words meant anything, then Ike, the cautious wartime commander, was turning rash. America's interest was to oppose communism everywhere, regardless of the reality of each situation. He made the classic mistake of the idealist. He raised expectations which he could not match. The man charged with realizing these inflated expectations was the Secretary of State John Foster Dulles. Dulles presented himself as a lawyer, a Christian, an American patriot. I now think he was genuine in all three roles, but at the time, we thought him a bully and probably a hypocrite as well. It was a fundamental view that the universe has got moral principles which are sort of integrated into it, and that in the end, right, if pursued, will triumph. Uh, and. Uh, that, uh, that therefore we have a duty, so to speak, to try to be on the side of what is right, yeah. what is serving a human uh, dignity, what is serving human freedom, what is serving uh, the right of people to run their own affairs. Uh, these sort of values, which you probably identify as American, but he identified as universal. Watch how he mixes the language of the politician and the preacher. Imperialist dictatorships often present a formidable exterior. For a time, they seem to be hard, glittering, and irresistible. But in reality, they often turn out to be like underweighted sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. One lady isn't clapping. Perhaps she was English. What Dulles said was true, but it was the tone which put us off. Americans, like communists, are missionaries, but they're missionaries for democracy. The Lincoln Memorial here in Washington refreshes their faith, the faith that America exists not just to pile up wealth, but to free the slaves and create a better world. It was Lincoln who said of our Declaration of Independence that it gave liberty not alone to the people of this country, but hope for the world, for all future time. For Dulles, communism was the shadow of evil, the exact opposite of what Lincoln and America stood for. It wasn't enough to prevent the shadow spreading. America should rescue the people that lived in darkness and bring them into its own American light. So Dulles preached liberation. And of course, the people in darkness listened. A fine idea, but how could you actually achieve it? Dulles laid hold on this idea of liberation. And I was uh, among those who felt this was a, a nutty idea, that it was not possible at all. To, we had neither the means nor the possibility of pushing the Soviets out of the Eastern Europe, by for, except by force, which, and if force would essentially destroy the, our alliance and also probably bring on World War III. So it was simply non-starter. John Foster Dulles won a reputation as a moralizer, somebody who preached too loud, too often, for the good of America. In his time, it was as if the realism and the idealism were galloping through the policy-making system without anybody actually bringing them together into harness to produce something useful. And another idea began to get a grip at that time. If communism was the only serious evil in the world, then any regime which was anti-communist, or said it was anti-communist, got unqualified support, no questions asked. And it was this idea which gradually drew the United States of America into the morass of the Vietnam War. Vietnam, Vietnam. It was just starting when I began as a young diplomat back in 1954. In those days, it was a war between France and the communist-backed forces of Ho Chi Minh, who were trying to win independence from France. America couldn't see it as an anti-colonial war. They heard only the onward march of communism. So Dulles first lent the French fighter aircraft. 
When these were not enough, he decided all the West should join in. We are actively seeking to develop a collective defense system for Southeast Asia. We are running into the normal amount of difficulty, but I feel confident that the outcome will be such that communist aggression will not be able to gain in Southeast Asia the results that it seeks. This may involve serious commitments by us all, but free people will never remain free unless they are willing to fight, if necessary, for their vital interests. But what vital interests? Anthony Eden, our experienced foreign secretary, couldn't see any. He just saw all of us being sucked into an unnecessary war. I admired Anthony Eden. I still do, though it's not exactly fashionable. An old Etonian, none the worse for that. Handsome, brave, temperamental. He'd been foreign secretary before, during, and after the war. Eden knew the danger of letting rhetoric outrun reality. Eden didn't preach. In fact, he deliberately kept his speeches low-key, even dull, boring. He waited painfully long to take over from Churchill as prime minister. His health began to give way, his face grew haggard, but he continued to put his professionalism to good effect. Britain and the world benefited. Eden was chairman with the Russians of the Geneva Conference on Asia. Delegates came not just from Korea and Vietnam, but also, to American alarm, from communist China. And of course Russia. Eden's readiness to sup with the devil scandalized the Americans. The hopes and fears of the world center on Geneva as the first sessions dealing with Korean and Indo-Chinese problems get underway. Spearheading the Reds are Foreign Minister Molotov and his deputy Andrei Gromyko. Anthony Eden voices Britain's wait-and-see policy as Red China's Cho Enlai demands equality at the conference and warns America to stay out of Asia. In the middle of the conference, the French army surrendered. Dulles, the idealist, required that the West should step in to defend freedom, but he needed British support to carry Congress with him, and he didn't get it. Maybe Eden didn't understand, but uh, in any event, Eden pulled out and didn't want to go and do anything because he thought it would jeopardize the uh, negotiations in Geneva. In any event, uh, therefore, uh, to some extent from that point on, uh, Dulles had to play a lone hand. At the conference with Soviet agreement, Eden pushed through the idea of a divided Vietnam with the North Communist and the South pro-Western. It was the best deal available, but it was a compromise. Can you compromise between good and evil? For Dulles, a battle against communism had been lost. For Eden and most of us, peace had been saved. Five years ago, I suggested that a bust of Anthony Eden should stand here at the foot of the Foreign Office stairs. Why? Well, in the 50s, as young diplomats, we hardly saw him, but we hugely admired his skill and his courage as Foreign Secretary. He seemed to us, perhaps not gold, but pure silver. Silvery in the way he looked, silvery in his experience, silvery in the way he expressed himself. 1954 was his great year. In 1954, he seemed to stop almost single-handed the war in Indochina, to bring the Chinese communists into dialogue for the first time, to prevent the Americans blundering into war. And later in the same year, he rescued European defense from a real failure by giving a pledge on behalf of the British Army of the Rhine. He seemed he was the very model of modern diplomacy, which is why it was quite out of character for him to pitch us two years later when he was prime minister into the confusions of Suez. The memory of Suez still depresses me. We had no plan, no clear purpose in invading Egypt. We failed the test of realism, which we loved to apply to others. 
We intervened to keep the canal open and our own action closed it. Never again were we treated as a first-rank power. But the cruel test for Dulles came from elsewhere. While the world wrangled over Suez, the people of Hungary rose against the communists. Liberation was becoming reality. And the heroic people of Hungary challenged the murderous fire of the Red Army tanks. These patriots value liberty more than life itself. And all who peacefully enjoy liberty have a solemn duty to seek by all truly helpful means that those who now die for freedom will not have died in vain. That sounded like an offer of help. American radio broadcasts said much the same. So the Hungarians looked to the West. It seemed to me that we had misled them. I don't know exactly what anybody might have expected in terms of American assistance, and it's hard to measure whether this was or was not a major factor in leading to it. But I felt that we had certainly led encouragement to believe that we would somehow back them up, and either clandestinely or in some way. And I felt that was bad. Help came there now. What came were Russian tanks. Because in the real world, Hungary was in Russia's backyard. This is Hungary calling. This is Hungary calling. Early this morning, the Soviet troops launched a general attack on Hungary. We are requesting you to send us immediate aid for the sake of God and freedom and of Hungary. The ideal may have been liberation. The reality would have been nuclear war. 20,000 Hungarians died. Within two years, Dulles himself died of cancer. Dulles was a good man at heart who stood for what most of us believe. He failed because of this passion for preaching. When the sermon clashed with reality, he expected reality to give way. And that's a poor basis for making foreign policy. Since its birth, the UN had lingered in the shadows. Now it came alive. Last autumn, in a neglected corner of the UN building in New York, was an exhibition to an unlikely pioneer and prophet of peace. Dag Hammarskjöld, the UN's second Secretary General. He too was an idealist, but his idealism took the form, not of sermons, but of painstaking work problem by problem to establish an order with the UN at its head. While there, my mind turned back to the mid-50s, when, as a young diplomat, I used to take the lift up to his modern, Scandinavian-style office at the top of the UN building. Forty years ago, I used to come quite often to this room, the Secretary General's office on the 38th floor. Not because I had anything as a young diplomat to contribute to the talks which he had with uh, Bob Dixon, my ambassador, but uh, for another reason. Dag Hammarskjöld spoke with a very strong Swedish accent. He also used very complicated sentences with long, qualifying phrases. My job was to sit tight and quiet on this sofa, memorizing exactly what the Secretary General said so that I could send an accurate account to the Foreign Office afterwards of his views. At his inauguration, Hammarskjöld made his position clear. His efforts would be governed not by power, but by the rule of law. This work must be based on respect for the laws by which human civilization has been built. It likewise requires a strict observance of the rules and principles laid down in the charter of this organization. <laughs> 
It was a delightful uh, misunderstanding by the permanent members of the Security Council. They thought they were appointing a non-political technocrat. Exactly. Which is what Hammarskjöld had mostly been up to that Indeed. point. Uh, and certainly when he arrived, people were very impressed by how modest he was, how sure. quiet, and so on. And nobody had glimpsed the, the other Hammarskjöld, the which was a, 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 an evangelical missionary person yeah. who had extremely high standards, who believed the Charter was a set of principles you had to put into effect and who was a sort of intellectual in action. Hammarskjöld was a breath of fresh air in the Cold War. He had no battalions to challenge a superpower, but he used reason to defuse problems that were dangerously raising the temperature. So he found a way out of Syria for Britain and France. He helped free American prisoners of war in China. He eased tensions in the Middle East. Hence the new cry, leave it to die. It's difficult to remember now that Hamschel was a tremendously respected person worldwide. Sure. You could go to New Delhi or Rio de Janeiro or Cairo, and the average taxi driver would have heard of Hamschel, and what was even more surprising would have a fairly clear idea of what he was trying to do, which is charisma, I suppose. I could never see how this was done. Hamschel was a very shy man. He didn't like making speeches. But in some way, he got across. Yes. Maybe it's a particular Swedish quality. I don't know. He invented the Blue Helmets, the peacekeepers, a neutral force whose aim is not to take sides, but to keep them apart. They provide no magic, but at their best, they're a practical way of fulfilling the UN's ideals. So Hammarskjöld found the UN a talking shop. He changed it into an active player in the search for peace. He made the UN more than its members. And he, and he made the, and well, this was where he began to run into trouble. He began in his second term to make speeches about there being a force greater than any one member, which was when all the members got together and decided to do something. And then, of course, by definition, the Secretary General was usually the person who was orchestrating it. And I think this is what put the wind up, uh, not just Khrushchev, but uh, certainly the goal, certainly at various points, the Americans, and I think possibly the British as well. The Congo was his undoing. In 1960, it gained independence from Belgium and the Belgians pulled all their people out. Tribal rivalries erupted, and as we've recently seen again, the Congo falls easily into civil war. Hammarskjöld sent in his peacekeepers, but this time they met a harsh truth. There was no peace to keep, especially when the superpowers took an interest. They armed the tribal factions. There was no room for diplomacy. Hammarskjöld's peacekeepers were caught in the crossfire. The UN learned the reality that when people were determined to kill each other in their own country, they could do little about it. Hammarskjöld, as so often, flew out to help. His plane crashed. With him died the hope of a UN which could sometimes spread the rule of law, sometimes replace passion with reason. Townshall was way ahead of his time. I mean, he was a person who saw his job as creating a sort of new level of international consciousness which would be expressed more and more in legal arrangements so that you would eventually turn the the, the UN from a sort of institutional arrangement with the General Assembly and the Security Council and the member states and everything into almost a constitutional arrangement which would have, which have legal powers which would actually be able to do things of a prescribed kind in particular circumstances and so on, which the UN isn't at the moment. I mean, he saw the UN as developing into a constitutional organization. Hammarskjöld was buried at home with sober Swedish ceremony. Because his life ended in a failure, many regard him as a footnote in history. I disagree. Since the end of the Cold War, the UN has again begun to work actively for a more peaceful world. The example had been set 30 years ago by Dag Hammarskjöld. Dag Hammarskjöld was a great man. I, I thought so then and I think so now. He wasn't at all pompous. 
but he was dignified and reserved. It, it was hard to get at him. But you realised pretty quickly that he was led, perhaps even driven, by a strong personal calling, uh, a mission which was almost mystic. He was a photographer of Swedish lakes, mountains, forests. He was a philosopher, and those two things, I think, were important. He had a vision of the United Nations under his leadership as something which was higher, superior to the interests and ambitions of individual nations, even strong ones. This got him into trouble with all the great powers, really, in turn. But he left behind a reputation and an idea which is still with us. From the middle-aged Swedes to the glamorous young American, John F. Kennedy. He confirmed his country's idealism in words which became immortal. Let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, to assure the survival and the success of liberty. Eisenhower's old sentiments had been turned into golden phrases. But any foe, anywhere, at any price? <laughs> Vietnam, for example. There, American idealism wrestled with reality and took a disastrous fall. Ho Chi Minh ruled the North, and he was fighting to win the South as well. He was a nationalist and a communist. America saw only the communist and decided that he must be stopped. I think today one can argue whether, uh, had we been uh, more sensitive, to what Ho Chi Minh uh, uh, was as a human being. By the way, I read that he had been a pastry cook at the Savoy Hotel. That's certainly true. He was. <laughs> I, yes. I couldn't believe that. I don't know what the pastry was like. Nor, nor I. But he also spent time in this country. And I think one could argue that he was much closer to a Tito than he was to a Khrushchev. And that, therefore, Eisenhower's fear, Kennedy's fear, Johnson's fear, my fear, that the dominoes, i.e., the free nations of Asia, would fall. Uh, to, to uh, controlled by the Chinese Communists and the Soviet Communists if we lost Vietnam was unjustified. Kennedy chose to fight Ho with American values. Robert McNamara went to arm the allegedly democratic President Diem. Surely once the people of the South had a dose of democracy, they would desert Ho. But Diem was no Democrat. He was corrupt, he put down no roots. America failed to see that the more they backed him, the more the support for the communists grew. There is this conviction that the American values are universally valid and can be applied regardless of cultural circumstances. And it still dominates an important aspect of current opinion, one in which liberals and conservatives actually agree that we can use democracy as a strategic weapon to undermine our opponents. In the end, the CIA backed a coup against Diem, who was murdered. If the South could not elect a decent government, America would give it one. What followed was a succession of equally unpopular military regimes. Kennedy, who understood foreign affairs, was succeeded by Lyndon Johnson, who didn't. Johnson inherited Kennedy's foreign policy team of McNamara and Dean Rusk, and an America confident in its strength and its missionary zeal. If the South Vietnamese lacked the will to defend their freedom, Johnson would do it for them. It was America's interest, her moral duty. Yep. American lives must end and American treasure be spilled in countries that we barely know. <laughs> <laughs> 
then that is the price that change has demanded of conviction. First, in went the bombers. Then, in went the troops to defend the bombers. The president has stated that we will send an additional 50,000 men to South Vietnam. When the Marines were first landed at Da Nang, we were told that the objective was to defend the, the air base. How do you resolve that, sir, with your statements in Saigon that their objective is to kill the Viet Cong? Uh, you can't defend a, a place like that by sitting on your ditty box. You've got to get out and aggressively uh, patrol. In went 50,000 troops to aggressively patrol. The president has today asked the Congress for a supplement of $700 million to the defense budget of fiscal 65. Then 50,000 more. I have today ordered to Vietnam the Air Mobile Division and certain other forces which will raise our fighting strength from 75,000 to 125,000 men almost immediately. Additional forces will be needed later. Half a million additional forces were needed later. The reality was a torment hard to grasp. The Vietnamese did not want America's ideals, and no amount of hardware would change that. This was the tragedy of Vietnam. American idealism turned brutal. The gifts which the Vietnamese rejected were flung at them from bombers and rocket launchers. It made no sense, and America drifted into moral confusion. I got a letter from LBJ. It said, this is your lucky day. Time to put your khaki trousers on. We've got a job for you to do. Dean Rusk has caught the Asian flu, and we are sending you to Vietnam. Lyndon Johnson told the nation, have no fear of escalation. I am trying everyone to please. Though it isn't really war, we're sending 50,000 more to help save Vietnam from Vietnamese. We all want to rid ourselves of these communists. Why don't we do it? Yes, they're traitors to America. Next to homosexual, Sadly, I remember way back yonder in November when he said I'd never have to go. But Lyndon Johnson told the nation, have no fear of escalation. I am trying everyone to please. Though it isn't really war, we're sending 50,000 more to help save Vietnam from Vietnamese. Another good man, Bob McNamara, besieged in the Pentagon, opposed by his own children, left office in 1968. He embodied the moral confusion of the period. America waited for his words. Mr. President, <coughs> I cannot <coughs> find words to uh, express what lies in my heart today. <coughs> and I think I'd better respond on another occasion. It's almost as though we thought we were omniscient. That we're wiser than the rest of the world. We're not omniscient. And God knows we've given evidence we're not wiser than, than many other nations, with respect to Vietnam as an illustration. So I think it is absolutely wrong for us as a nation to say, because we're pursuing our moral principles, and everyone else opposes the particular action that we consider moral, we're going to go ahead unilaterally. It took many years for America to come to terms with Vietnam and build this fitting monument. It has dignity, but no glory. It lists those who died for an ideal that didn't work. There are universal values, but they can't be imposed by one country on another. Freedom has to grow out of its own soil. So the next president all but abandoned idealism, but it was he who got the American troops out of the jungle. 
Richard Nixon. At home, Nixon carried realism beyond its proper bounds into cynicism, abuse of power. But abroad, it worked. One of his best moves was his first, the appointment of the Prince of Realists. Ladies and gentlemen, today I am pleased to announce the first appointment of the White House staff in a major policy position. Uh, Dr. Henry Kissinger, Professor of Government at Harvard University. I think it is important to analyze what one means by, uh, by human rights issues. And uh, there's no problem that flagrant violations of civil liberties and of, of uh, decent human conduct will evoke some response. Uh, but whether we have the right to prescribe the legal forms by which they govern themselves and insist on Western-type pluralistic democracy uh, or else we there are uh, periodic sanctions, that is a, that is a different matter. We, that's never been done in foreign policy. I'm biased because Henry is a friend, but I think he got it right. He's a man of ideas, and he brought back together the twin strands of realism and idealism. There was no betrayal in acknowledging that the communists were there and that you could never defeat them in arms. So you had to live with them and find other ways of sapping their strength, ending their tyranny. I was trying to move the conflict as much as possible from the strategic realm to the political realm. And uh, I, I was convinced not that the Soviet Union would collapse, but that our systems on the whole were more vital than the Soviet system, and so that in a prolonged period of political conflict, we had relatively less to fear from, from the Soviet Union. The greatest coup made possible by this new approach was the rapprochement with China. Forget the past, don't shout, keep human rights on the agenda, but low down, and see what happens. Bring your long spoon, that is, but don't be afraid to sup with your enemies. Communism could be softened by diplomacy. One of the things that drives our critics of the Nixon administration crazy is that we did right things for what they consider the wrong reasons. We wanted to break up the monolithic nature of the communist world and absorb Soviet energies in other parts of the world. And we wanted to demonstrate to our own people that we had a notion of peace that we could implement. So all of these elements brought us together. So we were not speaking about peace in the abstract and brotherhood with the Chinese, who were quite ideological at the time. We had specific, definable objectives. And it worked. In the summer of 1973, drawn by this new American friendliness, but worried by the rapprochement with China, a confused Soviet leader looked for a deal. Brezhnev came to Washington. Kissinger offered him what Russia wanted. No more talk of liberating Eastern Europe. The West would accept, in theory as well as in practice, the reality of a divided Europe. We said, here's the Soviet Union. It has tens of thousands of nuclear weapons. It has a predominant army. And it is so frantic about getting recognition of its borders. Uh, that's not a sign of strength. That's a sign of weakness. So the resulting Helsinki Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe met amid a predictable outcry from those who felt the West was betraying its ideals. But the Soviet Union had the poor end of that bargain. Western diplomacy turned out to be the more subtle and far-seeing. Brezhnev received only what he already had. In exchange, he guaranteed human rights behind the Iron Curtain and gave the West for the first time the right to interfere if they were breached. I remember as a young politician thinking that the Helsinki Final Act would be a lot of hot air. But I was wrong, and Henry Kissinger was right. What happened was that, because of the final act, many people, including myself, were able later to raise specific cases in Moscow. 
cases of people who were being oppressed, of Jews, for example, who were being refused permission to leave the Soviet Union. Gradually, slowly, these people were let go. It was a good example in practice of the harnessing of realism and idealism in foreign policy. Thanks to Helsinki, hundreds of thousands of Jews were released, including Nathan Sharansky. And its effects went deeper. It gave effective political and moral support to those like Solidarity in Poland and its leader Lech Walesa, who were trying to claim rights we all take for granted, free trade unions, civil liberties. By diplomacy, we began to achieve what we'd failed to achieve in Hungary in 1956. As far as we were concerned in Washington, I think we achieved more than we realized. We did not expect to see people like Havel and Valesa, who actually used it in the country to undermine it. We were delighted when it happened. In Czechoslovakia, Václav Havel founded Charter 77 on the basis of Helsinki. It gave the dissidents and the protesters the unanswerable legitimacy they needed to challenge communism. Helsinki did not liberate the Eastern Bloc, but it was the best we could do, and this time, it was something. The rest lay with those who lived in the oppressed countries. Much courage was still needed on their part. They showed it. Remember how extraordinary these pictures from Prague were at the time when we first saw them. A new and more hopeful chapter could open in the search for peace. Next week, Douglas Hurd looks at his time in office during the Gulf War and the collapse of Yugoslavia. That's at the same time, 7.45. Coming up tonight on BBC Two, The Money Programme. Dispatch.